Welcome to The Jay Martin Show. My name is Jay Martin, and my guest today is Sir Stephen Wilkinson. Now, I stumbled onto Sir Stephen because he was a guest on Grant Williams' podcast. He's also a very close friend of Grant's. I subsequently began reading his Substack and was completely taken by his thought process and writing. So an absolute honor to have Sir Stephen on the show today. Now, the front end of this interview we talk largely about the business cycle and the health of balance sheets in the United States. Stephen spent decades restructuring distressed companies and is intimately familiar with what it takes for a company to succeed through volatility and stay profitable, turn around after a point of chaos and all of this. The significance is that we live in a world which is largely addicted to cheap credit and that's fine as long as cheap credit is available, but when it stops becoming available, things get real, real fast. And we're beginning to understand what that may look like for the balance of this decade. He does a great job at holding this up relative to the real estate cycle, which has a massive consequence on everything that occurs in the Western world. And he breaks this down into essentially 20 year cycles, 18 year cycles that he's watched and studied over the last 200 plus years. The second half of this interview is where it gets really juicy. We get into the thinking of classical libertarian values and how important they are today. Now, for someone like myself, who tends to mind my own business and just do my own thing, I stay in my own lane, I watch the chaos and, and all of this hitting mainstream headlines, but I don't engage. Now, Stephen makes a great point about why it's so important to, yes, mind your own business and stay in your own lane, but why right now it's more important than ever to stand up, be a bit more vocal, and at least set an example for how you feel the world should be by sticking to some core libertarian principles, ownership over your decisions, right? Uh, um, avoiding violence and the importance of property rights, real basic stuff. Don't hurt people, right? You own what you own and respect your decisions and take accountability for them. I mean, very, very simple things to live by. Look, this interview was fascinating. And I know I've said this before. I mean it every time I say it. One of my top five conversations I've had on the channel, and I know you're going to enjoy it. So stick through to the end and please check out Steven's Substack. It's called The Pitchfork Papers. So look this up on Substack. And as always, I publish a weekly newsletter and I absolutely love writing it. There's a link beneath this piece of content where you can subscribe. You'll hear from me every Sunday. It's free. Why wouldn't you do it? It's, this is where I catalyze my thoughts from the week, everything I've learned, read, conversations I've had on the podcast and everything in between and spit it out in a weekly essay every Sunday. Hit that link and join the team of 40,000 other investors. I love doing it. Okay, here is Sir Stephen Wilkinson. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, here I am joined by Sir Stephen Wilkinson. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been following your work, a um, few interviews you've done. You're writing on Substack, massive fan of what you create. Thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. It's real privilege to be on. So here's where I'd love to start, just in your own words. If my audience is not familiar with you or your work or your businesses, could you give us the quick highlight overview um, who are you and how do you spend your time? A really good question. Um, well, I'm an Englishman, um, 1963 vintage. Um, I leave you to figure out how old I am. I'm still having difficulty articulating that. Um, I studied at, I studied German with a focus on medieval German literature at Durham in the early 1980s and moved to Germany to take a job with Merrill Lynch at the age of 23, I think. Um, they were, it was just after the Big Bang um, in the city of London. The Americans were coming over and colonizing the financial markets of um, the UK and, and the rest of Europe. Um, and I was at the, the cusp of that invasion. They were looking for anyone with a two hands a good tie, tie um to come okay. in and start working um so i moved to germany to munich with the idea of doing that for two years and spent 28 years there in all so i spent the, the bulk of my um career in germany in finance in one form or another um, was i left Merrill after three years decided that really wasn't my cup of tea um was hired at a very young age as a 
as head of investment strategy for a fast growing wealth management company. Um, they took a, a fly on me um, and enjoyed that enormously. I think I, I learned I learned how to speak the language of numbers in an investment environment from the, the years that I was there. And then towards the end of the 90s, <clears throat> I decided I wanted to run my own balance sheet. Um, I was offered a partnership, a junior partnership in the business that I was in, and that would have been a really smart career move, but I would have done that for the next 30 years. Partners, senior partners were still fairly young, and the idea of just waiting, like Prince Charles, until his until the mum drops off, I that wasn't something that I was too impatient for that. <clears throat> I wanted to run my own balance sheet. I wanted to do things and be active um, in that and the edge between business and financial markets. And that's effectively what I did. Um, got into restructuring by accident or possibly not quite by accident um, during the, the rump phase of the um, internet bubble, um, which is one that I missed completely from because my training is as, is as an value investor. Um, I couldn't see anything. I didn't understand it. But at that time, and it was a great time to start a business in 1998, investing, if you were a value investor, because there were some unbelievable bargains in real businesses, as capital was being sucked out of everything and reallocated to the new things, the old things were very cheap. Um, and and I, I ended up with a partner setting up Germany's first publicly quoted restructuring business, which was phenomenally successful successful in the sort of years 2002 to 2007. Um, <clears throat> and in this case, were you, were you buying distressed assets, restructuring? Yes, assets? from, yeah, from business, not publicly traded assets, but we were buying them from, from businesses, large enterprise size, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 businesses in Europe um, as they were divesting their portfolios. Um, yes. And there was what we found, and it was very interesting, that um, that there is no value, career value, to a manager in a large enterprise of restructuring a badly performing business and making it okay. It's the effort that in a large business, an enterprise size, there is no kudos. You don't get any points. You don't move higher up the ladder. There's no career advantage to sorting out a mess that's been there for five years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, it slows you down. It takes your attention away from the new shiny things that the, the company is refocusing on. So there is a, a very strong incentive or well, there was in the in the early part early years of the two thousands, there was a very strong incentive to just get rid of it. And the way that the counting works in large companies is if you decide that you want to shut a business, let's say it's got it does fifty million in revenue and it has I don't know five hundred people working for it, maybe two hundred fifty people working for it. Um, it has it's overstaffed. It's got large corporate overheads that it has to somehow um, carry. The way that you close it is by looking at all of your contracts and doing an end of life value. So you look at a rental contract or a tenancy that you know, you've got on a building that runs five years, you price in the whole five years. You look at your, your um, employee contracts and you, you price every single one of them as it should be because that's your legal obligation. And you end up with a sum that you then put as a restructuring charge in that quarter. Now, if somebody comes along and offers you, offers to take that business off you for less than the restructuring charge, in other words, let's say the restructuring charge is 20 million on that business. And I come along and I'll say, if you give me 15, I'll do it. Yeah. Take it off your hands. You get to write back 5 million in the next quarter. So it looks great. Okay. And it's much, much easier to do that than to actually go through the 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 motions of, of restructuring it yourself so right. that doesn't happen and there's that means the market at that point is extremely inefficient so you can buy assets that require some restructuring 
but usually if you if you've done your homework properly you can usually restructure at a far less lower price than the full value or even the discounted value of the amount of money that you've taken so we spent I don't know, five or six years doing some fantastic um transactions um not a business that i love particularly um but it was very lucrative um okay. and so to answer your question i came to ireland in um 2015 um made a deliberate decision to leave germany for i i wanted to come back to the english-speaking part of the world that was certainly a big motivation but I also felt that Germany's business model was no longer, that its business model had peaked. Um, and um, there were some decisions being made, particularly around energy. Um, it was literally at the sort of tail end of Merkel's disastrous energy policy, which then fed into her disastrous uh, refugee policy. And you could just see that she was so distanced from real public opinion that she was making decisions that were purely political and and no longer based in what I would call common sense. Um, so we left. Um, we thought we'll try Ireland with an idea that if Ireland didn't work out, we would just move on to the US. That was, that was okay. definitely an option um, because I've spent a lot of time and do a lot of business in the US. And so to answer your question, so that's where I've been. I've been in markets. I'm a business investor and an advisor to leaders of businesses. I love doing that. And I like writing about life at the intersection of what I would call real business, financials, financial markets, and leadership. That's where I find it most interesting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, now given your your history, experience, and perspective, specifically when it comes to restructuring distressed assets, identifying weak points, and fixing those. What strikes you as most concerning in the private business cycle right now? Thinking through either, um, you know, private equity investments and and unrealized losses in the market, or just general credit reliant businesses. And if you can relate to the U.S. market great. If not globally, it's fine. But what strikes you as the biggest red flags right now in the business cycle that you're seeing? Well, you've mentioned it. It's it's an over-dependence on cheap leverage. Um, and we are just starting to see what happens when the price of capital, even if only for a short time, returns to somewhere close to equilibrium price. I mean, equilibrium pricing for long-term capital has no business being anywhere under 3% in a mature, it just it makes no sense. So having I mean, capital that's been priced under price for such a long time has led to a great deal of malinvestment, assets being purchased at ridiculous prices, which will always come out in the wash. You know, for, for people who um people who are looking for and I, I I've left the business of distressed assets it's a whole it's a different ball game let's say it's a younger man's game but um if, if you're looking for well-priced assets or decently priced assets let alone bargains it's a very difficult time in um in in the phases where there is where the capital is too cheap but the danger at the moment is that we will see a repricing of capital across the entire yield curve, um, a repricing of risk premium, and that that will sink a large number of businesses and business projects that literally should not have been financed in the first place. So, I mean, that's what the cycle is, isn't it? I mean, the cycle, the cycle gets killed by by rising interest rates and by marginal projects that one after another start falling off the edge um and leading to some sort of cascade of repricing um which place at which point a very large number of businesses start going under as a result of their um their debt structures it, it makes and the way you phrase it right because you're right at zero percent interest rates any business kind of makes sense and you know in theory right when money is that cheap and so 
um, a large variety get finance that have no business being in business, have no business receiving financing? Are there any specific verticals that you see as more vulnerable than others? And it struck me when you said that you missed the, you know, the the uh, 99 tech bubble because you were a value investor and you didn't see value. And that caused you to overlook maybe what a speculator may have seen. Um, if I understood that correctly, do you see any... Okay. Do you see any verticals today that are more vulnerable than others? And where's the opportunity? Do you see opportunity for savvy value investors right now who are aggressive enough to move in and look for opportunities? Um, or is it too soon? Well, what, what do you think? The, I'm, not a, I'm not in the business of stock picking. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, but the, the home builders in the U.S., look like interesting cases at the moment. I mean, okay. There's so much pressure in the housing market. Um, we're not at the top of the cycle yet. It feels as if we are, but we're not. Uh, so we've okay. got another, I, I would suggest we have another three years to run of this cycle. Um, one of the questions that you asked me in preparation for this interview was, what are people, what are people seeing wrongly or what, where is sort of the, the the public narrative at odds with what is really happening? Um, and my suggestion would be that the F the Fed pivoting and finding different ways to reintroduce liquidity into the markets is the one thing that people are underpricing at the moment, um, and that will have a powerful effect on on housing and land prices at this point of the cycle. So that's. Yeah. That's one area where I'm seeing it, and it was a, there's a lot of pressure coming into that market. Um, if you if you follow FinTwit, you know, the the doom and gloom in the housing market is relentless. It <laughs> it's is. really relentless. It is. Um, and when something gets that relentless, and the supply and demand, um, the supply and demand experience is a different one than you know, if you go into markets and actually look at supply and demand there is an undersupply and an over demand still of housing i think a lot of the highly leveraged airbnb um speculators are finding that that is not a one-way street you know, as many of these new business models attract um i'm going to call it kiyosaki speculators um you know, people who jump onto anything that has cash flow in it and say, well, we're going to build up this huge portfolio of Airbnb apartments. They're being torn to pieces at the moment, um, which again, makes for great opportunities. So wherever you can see the pain, that's usually a good place to look for, for opportunities. And I think that the US housing sector, particularly in, um, particularly in the new conurbations that have seen rapid growth, I think there's still a great deal of, under supply and over demand, which okay. will balance out as soon as interest rates start plateauing again. And you think that's the case, whether through a Fed pivot or some kind of creative stimulus, there's more money I coming. Do. Yeah, I think there is. Yeah. I, I think I think the I think the the, the Fed are going to find it difficult to to aggressively drop interest rates, having aggressively lifted them over the last six months. Yeah, but they will find other ways of of mitigating that and doing it anyway yeah they, they can be incredibly creative in terms of how they get money right out to the economy yeah. uh would it be a fair assumption for me to make or would this be fantasy that i would just like to be true that debt eventually forces austerity i mean that's that's something in my life that would be true it should be true in, in the u.s economy as well but we're really efficient at kicking that austerity can down the road you know it will there be do you expect some kind of a hard reckoning eventually and and what might that look like well you started off with a with a truism that sounded like that that needs qualifying does debt lead to austerity absolutely not if it's invested if it's taken on as capital with a with a with a function for creating productive assets 
Yeah. Okay. So, okay. That's if I have, if I have a productive asset that, that I borrow money judiciously to finance, then the austerity bit never really materializes because if I'm, if the act, if the asset is productive, well, then I'm using that cash flow in a tax efficient manner to pay it down again. So I'm avoiding end austerity by having a little bit of austerity built into the system every every year as i amortize so intelligent use of debt is is at the heart of business and we and everybody just does it. i don't know a single business that doesn't run on some form of debt whether it's just from their suppliers and sure. having intelligent trade terms or working capital facilities from their bank or depending on the other side of the balance sheet longer structured debt that is term matched to the assets that it's supporting but if you do that intelligently well then it's always going to be cheaper than equity it's always going to be tax advantageous and over time sort of underlying inflation will always make it a good idea always um but i think the question you were asking is if we if we borrow for consumptive purposes Will that eventually always catch us up? And you know the answer to that, and I know the answer to that, and it is yes. Because what you're doing by buying consumption today, it's like taking on debt in a company to finance losses. You can only do that for a certain amount of time before the business becomes completely insolvent. And if there are no assets being built up on the other side and it's just going to fund deficits, well, then eventually there is there is no more future for you to borrow from because the future is only predicated on the investments that we make today. That's why the Keynesians and the people who are running government money and have been for the last 50 years are absolutely wrong when their knee-jerk reaction is to drive consumption rather than investment and capital formation. Capital formation is what creates the consumption of the future not the other way around. And if you look at every single recession, crisis in markets, the very first thing that every single politician, Fed, and money manager or money governor will talk about is this urgent need to get consumption going again. We need people to buy stuff instead of doing what is sensible, which would be to make the formation of capital attractive. But they can't do that because that... The, the system is dependent on this short-term debt mentality, which, because it's funding deficits, so paying and not paying for, for productive assets, is always going to end in tears, always. I publish a weekly newsletter every Sunday. If you would like to subscribe, hit the link right beneath this video. Now, I'm an investor, but I don't write about managing money. I write about managing my mind. Without question, the hardest and most important part of allocating capital through volatility and getting some back. If you want to read my newsletter, hit the link right beneath this video. I know you'll love it. Now back to the interview. Enjoy. And in theory, it would with the Federal Reserve who finances consumption consistently. If this was a business of any kind, eventually you would become, as you said, completely insolvent. You could argue that the Fed is completely insolvent today uh, except that they can continue to create and, and print more debt as needed. Uh, how? What's your take on how this situation results eventually? And, and is there an eventually? Because I've been hearing the eventually story for 15 years. You know, what's your take on on how this game ends? And if you care to speculate on when, I, I'd love to hear that. But I'm more curious about how. I think... For the record, I think the next cyclical peak will be the one that breaks the system. Okay. Because the the magnitude of the mean regression of asset prices has to be so large and it will be accelerated by and and caused by the large amount of debt in the system in the first place that the resulting um the resulting 
adjustment in asset prices will be so vicious that it will put people off risk assets of a certain type, leverage leverage anything for a generation. And if you um, if you look at the price, if you look at the chart of of um, of net of U.S. wealth against U.S. GDP on a log scale, we have never ever been as far away from from those two lines have never diverged to the extent that they've ever, that they are currently diverging. Never, never in in history have they have they diverged. That says to me that when the next market dislocation comes, and if we believe in mean regression, then the next one will be the unstoppable one because the Fed have run out of balance sheet. Where is it? Where are they going to take it to? Fifty trillion? They're going to take it to two times GDP? It's possible they might do. But at that point, the system has gone asymptotic and you know, the curve has just gone in its final exponential function. And we all know that that is unsustainable, so it breaks. Right. Um, and my guess is that the if you want to, if you want a, a guess as to where that wealth chart, that wealth line will go, well, then take it as far below the line as it normally as it has been over the last 10 years or the last 20 years above it and if you take out that spike over the last 10 years um then we're probably going to see it undershoot by i don't know 10 percent or 12 percent okay. but if you think about what that means for asset prices and leverage structures it will destroy an enormous amount of capital I, it'll be healthy but i don't think the system that emerges from that, I don't think that that will be the same one. And any fault lines that are currently being held by tape together in the system, in the, the American system, I think they will rupture at that point. I, I don't see it being, it's not going to be um, cataclysmic, but it will be generational. There'll be a, this will be a generational event. And my guess is it'll happen in twenty six. The end of 2026 beginning in 27 at the end of the this current you know 14 year land cycle which which sort of which pulses under the u.s economy with remarkable almost clockwork regularity over the last 220 years could i get you to expand on the land cycle a little bit for myself and my audience on the cyclicality duration and history as, as best you can yeah, well, it's um, there's an underlying 18.6 year cycle that is made up of two seven year upswings and a rough, roughly 14, 14 and a half years and a four year downswing. And it's as regular as clockwork. It's like it's like watching the sea in motion. Um, those it's not a 14 year because there's always a gap in the middle. There's always a, a break between year seven and year eight um which and just and if you if you know that the the, the last top was in 2008 cycl cyclical peak four years down took us to 2012 which was exactly where markets started re-energizing and seven years on from from that sort of mid 2012 was 19 where we had that very strong wobble in the um in the fall, early winter of 2019, into the COVID crash in March 2020. Um, I think it was the 13th, 12th, 13th of March that that was at its zenith or its nadir. Um, and very quickly after that, we emerged back onto the next seven years. And the next seven years, starting in the end of 2020, middle of 2020, take us up to the end of 26. And that cycle is, it, it works like clockwork. The under, if, you, if you take it back um, from 2008 as being the last peak and then take that back 14 years and then four years down, and you, you, you'll you see it with remarkable regularity. It got interrupted a little bit during the Second World War um, and the, the third 
FDR administration. But apart from that, it was clockwork. Going back 220 years. It's fascinating. Interesting. Okay. I need and to... Europe is, a, is Europe has usually been a year behind okay. the American cycle. And the UK somewhere in between. And I suspect that given the the um, the power of American institutional capital in Europe and the UK, that those cycles are being put closer, pulled closer together. I don't think there'll be as much of a lag this time. What what are the core drivers of this cycle? Do you have any thoughts on why why 18, 19 years, why two sevens and then a four? What what's that's a um I think it has to do with well, firstly, it definitely has to do with the pace of underlying economic activity and land speculation. That okay. that it takes it just takes time for the last cycle to be forgotten, for lending practices to start coming back again. I mean, um, I see that uh, I mean, uh, my my knowledge of real estate is not nearly as 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 prof or deep as it probably should be and not certainly not as um, I don't have as much experience to have in business but in business what when we come out of a recession which is always the most dangerous time for a business a lot of businesses survive through the recession but they'll be burning the furniture to keep the, the house warm and they will be they will be stripping back liquidity wherever they can find it they will not be Looking, they will not be uh, maintaining machinery. They will be laying stuff off. They will be they will be driving down stocks and um, and inventory. They will be they will be shortening their purchasing cycles and so on, just to conserve cash to get them through. And then what happens is when the when business starts picking up again, the banks' lending policies have not yet adjusted. So the business's most dangerous phase coming out is coming out of a recession when customers are starting to order again and they don't have the credit to restock their their inventory or restock or, or keep the machines running so that working capital lag is what which is what you need is always create sort of monopoly situations for companies that have all has gone into the storm with much higher levels of liquidity so a more conservative balance sheets and i have one business i know that um, that habitually runs 30% of its balance sheet as inventory because it has known in its 120-year history that whenever it comes out of a recession, having that inventory ready to supply customers that it wasn't working with before usually gives it somewhere between three and six percentage points of market share in the 18 months coming out of the recession. And they say, you know, we, we underperformed during the good times, but we claw it all back and more as we're usually the only game in town when we come out of a recession. So the reason the land cycle works like that is because lending practices take time to pick up again. It takes time to feed through into adjusted behavior at the lending institutions. And then when asset prices start being reflected in balance sheets and the lending practices have been, and the banks have caught up with that, then it takes you know time for um take you've got another i don't know 10 years of upswing um in which these things happen and um and then it always goes into a phase of um over speculation at the end when bank practices are at their most lax lending is at its most lax um and you know the, the projects that shouldn't be financed get financed because it's easy to get hold of the capital yeah and banks are competing in, as in any market, to expand their balance sheets and to get new customers. So therefore, I'm sure you're seeing all the calls for U.S. to head immediately towards a deep recession. There's all a variety of doom and gloom forecasts. Most of them are quite immediate, if not sort of 12 months. You're saying yes, but there's a bit more runway before we get there. And this- a lot more runway. What's that? Sorry? It's a lot more runway. A lot more runway. Well, a lot uh, up until twenty six, though, right? This is the right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's if you look at it as a fourteen year cycle, we've we've got and you know we've we've got three and a half years before we get there. Um, yeah. 
that's a you know twenty percent of the um, um, of the entire cycle that we've still got ahead of it. And it's the bit that's always the most difficult because the signals the signals are already mixed. Okay. You you okay. you your, you and your listeners will know the um, the wall of worry. The wall yeah. of worry when it starts going very steep that action is being is being is happening in less and less um areas of the economy so the more and more uh, sort of struggling to get to the summit and a lot of the headline activity that's driving indices and the things that people are looking at um is actually happening in a very very narrow area of the economy um, okay. which is why one of the most interesting things to look at is that divergence of performance from the top performers and, and the rest. You saw that beautifully in the run-up to um, 2020. You saw it last year too. Um, tech sector. And it, it, it's always... It, uh, but having that, I, that general picture of how the cycle is working is a really good map to navigate through because it, it does allow you to say, well, wait a second. If we're here in the cycle then this can't be the recession that finishes it. So you're looking, you're deliberately right. looking for evidence that the general sort of tendency um, is wrong, okay. which is a really healthy position to be in. Yeah. Now, now, how would you counsel uh, myself or my audience who are looking to protect the wealth that we've created uh, leading into this next transition of cycle? Um, what are the best insurance policies, safe havens, and are there any opportunities for upside or, you know, I'm not, not as curious about that as I am. How do you, how do you protect the wealth you've created? How do you maintain that through one of these transition periods? Yeah. Um, it's a really good question. Um, I remember having a conversation with my wife a year ago. We were, we go for a long walk. So 26 kilometer hike over the mountains on the last day of the year or the first day of the year, depending. Um, and we were having exactly this conversation. And I said, you know, if you if you're braced for impact and you lose 80 to 90 percent because your businesses go bust, your leverage structures are worth nothing, and you're left with 10. That 10, if it's a good 10, will be more than enough in a re in a reprogrammed or revaluated, a re um set economic environment to put you ahead of the game if you've got the right assets. Um so it, wealth, I think in a in a in a dire situation. You must always be prepared to take a significant drawdown on the, the value. You have to be. And you must be okay with that because in the drawdown, it's not that people are going to be left with, you know, the smart ones have got 100% of what they had beforehand, but they do have options to move liquidity or liquidity-like um, assets into productive assets because the productive assets are suddenly very cheaply priced at that stage. So your money has a relatively high value compared to what it had at the top. So I, you know, obviously keeping a roof over your head, having your mortgage paid off um, and not being in debt at all is a really smart thing to do going into the top of the cycle, just to make sure that, you know, you're using those extraordinary, above average capital gains and turning them into real gains and using those real gains to protect on the downside. I personally think that gold has its primary function at the in the second phase of the down draw of the drawdown in that cycle. Because gold is it's a really interesting conversation to have. And I don't know whether your your um, viewers and listeners are gold aficionados, whether they generally tend to like gold or not. But gold is is useless 
as a crisis asset because you can't do anything with it. You can't go out in the crisis. You can't go buy groceries with gold because you get knifed. And if you try to buy anything with gold, you'd be, you, you know, and people know that you have it. You're a tar- you've got a target on your back. So you can't use gold during the crisis. Gold has its maximum utility at the point when there is a, a when the when that phase is over, and you can start using it in a reinvigorated economy when they're you know people are still repairing their balance sheets badly, the ones that have survived. Asset prices generally tend to be at their cheapest then for the reasons that we've talked about beforehand. And gold then has maximum utility because you can swap it for productive assets. So it's it's gold is always an option. It's a it's an an option without a maturity date on productive assets. So just having it, you can't eat it, you can't do anything with it. You have to be prepared to swap it for productive assets at the right part of the cycle. And there is a phase and it's after the it's after the crash, it's after the repricing or the, the, the drawdown when things are just starting to pick up again. But there is no liquidity in the system, and people who have productive assets but can't afford to finance them or just don't want it anymore. I remember the last recession that we had in in two thousand nine and ten. I would be talking to business people who were in their, their late sixties, seventies, who just said, "I can't do this anymore." I'm done. I don't want to do this again. I'm too tired. Just take it off my hands. I, I don't want to put any more money in. I've I've got my house. I've got my my you know, retirement account, and I've, I I just don't. Want, I can't do it. I'm too old. I don't want to do this anymore. And there's a there's a lot of tired hands at the end of the sort of the final phase of the crisis. Sure. And they they will take whatever money you can give them and gold has has its maximum utility at that point because when else are you going to use it well it doesn't you can't do anything with it and usually in those that sort of environment there is some sort of stigma attached to having gold in the first place it might be a tax stigma it might be a social stigma it might even be illegal to have it right well you've got to be careful with it because you know gold is always a sign of is a withdrawal of trust from the fiat system, which is why governments don't want people to have it. Sure. Um, yeah. Interesting. You know, and I, I, I own gold for the reason you just described, um, and some physical silver, but mainly gold. Um, and the battle I believe I would face with that is that what I get in exchange for my physical gold is a decent night's sleep. I get peace of mind. That's what it, that's the utility that I receive knowing that it's an option on liquidity with no counterparty risk, with no maturity date, as you outlined. And having that as a father of three young kids gives me the peace of mind I need in chaotic times. The challenge I would face therefore is knowing when to call that option and say, I think this is about as bad as it's going to get. In fact, I think things are getting better, but there's no new liquidity in the system yet. This is my opportunity. And then I go, and after holding physical for 15, 20 years, I have to depart with that that um, that pillar of, of, uh, of peace <laughs> and security, right? Which is what I've received in exchange. In in exchange for a gamble, a bet on you know, and I understand. security of what though? What have you got when you've got gold? You've 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 now converted what was fiat into metal. Yes, you've got the metal. It's a store of value. There's no doubt about it. So it can't be taken away from you know, all, all those characteristics. But so what? So what? So what? So you, you know- can so you can sit down. So you can sit down and say, okay, I don't have a job. Yeah, 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 we're eating through our we're eating through our savings at a rate of knots. Yeah, and, but we but we have a cellar full of gold, and so we're what rich? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, what, I totally what, get it. Yeah, absolutely. I know, I know. It's I know. I, I absolutely, and uh, and and 
it, it doesn't do anything for me. So I would absolutely option that I, I believe, especially in, in time of necessity. I mean, that's what it does for me. It's not, it's like, I just, I know I have that option. If the business were to collapse. If wealth, wealth is built through the ownership of productive assets. That's how wealth is built. I believe that. Yeah. Only it's the only way that it's built. Now a productive asset can be a building. Sure. That you rent out. It can be some machinery. It can be inventory. It can be a combination of all of those things in a business. But that the only way that product that wealth is built ever is through the ownership of productive assets. So if I'm taking money or wealth out of productive assets and putting them into the single least productive asset on the planet, which is a lump of yellow metal. Yeah then surely only for the purpose of of storing the value and then reintroducing it into productive assets, productive assets. Yeah. at a moment when I feel comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel comfortable, then the time's not right. Yeah. And you say speculate, it's not speculating. If you If you have a business that has customers and the, where the assets are truly adding value to your market, then that is never speculative. It's only speculative if you pay a, such a large price for it that extraordinary things have to happen in terms of your margins and market growth for that price to be justified. Yeah. But if you're buying it at a discount and you can afford to own those assets at a fraction of the price, well, your balance sheet your balance sheet looks completely different and you can afford to produce more cheaply. You can afford to offer your, your goods more cheaply. You can afford to acquire market where people are paying you for the value that you add and suddenly you're a productive asset again. And that's the single, that's the only purpose I can think of for holding gold is to, is to protect the value that used to be in productive assets in order to reintroduce it to productive assets when you feel comfortable doing it but not to do it is i don't know <laughs> i don't know what the point is no I'm, I'm with you yes and i i guess where i'm coming from is that if what i receive in exchange for holding physical is uh is confidence and peace of mind the the value of that is better decision making better foresight less reactivity less panic in times of turmoil you know, if, if the broad equities market were to crash tomorrow, my day is not going to change. I'm going to do the same thing I was going to do anyways, right? Uh, and I'd like to feel that way in as many crisis scenarios as possible, that I have the option to sit back, do nothing and wait and wait for opportunity instead of reacting to price volatility and, and news flow and all of this stuff. And that's the utility I get from gold. There will be a time, yes, where I want to reinvest that back into something productive probably my own business or something like this. But, but yeah, that's, so that's but the, the psychological conflict I would have is that I'm trading that, that, uh, that, that, that insurance policy, that confidence that I, I purchased with owning physical in exchange for something that is not so boring and, and, uh, and, um, and stable. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. it, well, I, it does make sense. I'm trying to think through the logic of, of that. And there is a psychological yeah, yeah. <laughs> aspect to to that confidence, which then allows you to make more relaxed decisions and, and, and generally exude an air of confidence, which means that people will be more attract, attracted to you because you're resonating that confidence at a time when confidence is probably a very rare commodity. Sure. But I would say that the true confidence comes from your ability to be able to provide for your family, irrespective of what is happening outside. And I've been, I've, I've, we and my wife and I have, have um, encouraged our children, all of them, we've got four, to learn a trade. Okay. And yeah. Each one of our children is either on the path of or waiting to begin an apprenticeship in a trade because with a bag of tools as a carpenter, as a dressmaker, as a 
as an engineer, as a plumber, if you have good a level of self-confidence in your own ability to perform, and you've got a bag of tools, you will always be able to provide for your family. Always. Yeah. Having good manners and a trade at a time when, you know, maybe more ethereal jobs are far and few between. Being able to make a valuable contribution to your community by repairing a roof or by building a door or by putting in a plumbing or repairing something and keeping the family fed, I would suggest is a far stronger intrinsic yeah. motivator and builder of confidence than sitting with your cellar full of gold, but really <laughs> nothing else to do. I agree with you. Yes. I, I And I love the, the throw the tools in your trunk analogy because it's absolutely correct, right? That's a, a more important option to have in your back pocket is the ability to throw yeah. your tools in the trunk. There's a great film that came out in 2009, I think, called The Company Men with, um, I think it was Ben Affleck. Is, is that the actor that you feel like punching every time you see his face? He's got <laughs> um, and Kevin Costner, who plays his brother-in-law, about right. a business that goes under because it's over leveraged and private equity are in there. And it's about the company men at each stage. I think Tommy Lee Jones is one of the C's is the COO. And then at each level of management, there is, you know, there's a story of each one of them, how they cope with the recession and the business being closed. And Ben Affleck has to go and work for his brother-in-law who he doesn't like very much and who doesn't like him, but he's a tradesman. He, he's a house builder. Yeah. And he goes and works on the building side. And there were some very interesting conversations between Costner's character and Affleck's character, who comes with the smartest new tools and his shiny belt and um and has no idea what he's doing. And it's a very it's a very interesting film that I would suggest anybody watch who really wants to know what happens when shit hits the fat. Um and how okay. do you how do you regain your dignity and all right you know yeah sounds interesting okay i um i want to segue uh into another topic and i'm going to just grab a quote from something that you wrote and then i want to understand your process behind the quote so what i read was my journey from natural in quotes don't bother me conservative to radical libertarian has accelerated in the last 15 years. Yeah. And what I'd like to understand is why uh, trigger points and catalysts for that journey, why it's accelerating, and what's the definition of radical libertarian? So try and answer all of those questions very quickly. Um, a, I've, I felt that I hadn't moved very much in my philosophy of life and business. I've always been pro-business, pro very pro-liberty, particularly my own. Um, I've been suspicious of government, but not to the point of the bomb throwing. Um, I just thought that they weren't the most competent people in the on the um, in society, and that they was constrained by all sorts of, sort of institutional constraints, and that if push came to shove, better decisions are made by people on the ground who actually have to live with the consequences. So it was a small C conservative. And I was a fan of Margaret Thatcher's, um, more of the icon Margaret Thatcher than of her actual policies. Um, but I found that about 10, 12 years ago, that although I didn't feel that I'd moved very much in my thinking, I was no longer alive. The ground had sort of moved underneath me and it moved to the left. It had moved towards more government, more interference and a decay in normative behavior that was visible from Federal Reserve policy, business ethics, and this sort of general feeling that our financialized economy was leading to more concentration of power in power centers and that there was a blending of policy in the two main 
camps, left of centre, right of centre. And neither of them made very much sense because what was the centre had now moved to a more, um, how should I put it, collectivist way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yes. And an infantilization of the public. Um, yeah, okay, yep. And, and as we were being infantilized, I felt insulted. And as I felt insulted and constrained, I started becoming more sensitive and asking questions of, well, what do you actually believe? What is your policy? What at, at the very root of what you believe is the right way for society to organize itself. And I don't ever think that I've been particularly political, but I think the evolution of our society, which is a, a almost 100% a function of the debt accumulation and the very um, unethical um, and lax attitude towards money production, that that's a natural consequence of it. And so I had to start thinking about, well, what do I believe in? What are my principles? I'd never had to think about them before. I'd sort of taken them for granted because I didn't have to. You know, we had the checks and balances that we had 20 years ago with a free press holding government to account, a well-behaved civil service whose job it was to sort of make sure that ministers didn't do really stupid things and, you know, a vocal citizenry they sort of kept everybody pretty much in, in balance, but we were ratcheting up all the time. The, the sort of the normative behavior, the, the, the baseline of normative behavior was we were leaving that behind every year until you started noticing it. And, you know, the last five years have proven without a shadow of doubt that that we have we have now reached a level of constriction and corruption in the sense of of those various counterbalancing institutional forces now being merged into one. There is no diversity of power balance. There is no, there are, everybody's working towards the same objectives, which is extremely unhealthy. So the, you know, whether it's the police or the court, or the Supreme Court, or the political parties who no longer really represent anything, much of anything in their, in the diversity of their, their, um, um, their political, of their policies, we don't have that anymore. Um, and the only real, I mean, you end up standing in a libertarian space, which says, okay, well, I don't want all that government, so what do I want? Well, you go back to first principles, which forces you to look at the world through a libertarian first principles prism. And the first principles of libertarianism are that we own ourselves. It's number one. And number two is that nobody has the right to instigate violence against anybody else. And number three, and as a result of that, um, the inalienable right to own property. Inalienable. So you own yourself, you own your body. You mustn't, perpet you mustn't perpetrate violence on anybody else. And... You have the right to own property. And if you look at the way that our societies evolve, evolve, all of those primary pillars of a libertarian philosophy have been massively under pressure. And libertarianism is now a dirty word. But of course it is for the people who are in power. It's the worst. It's, you know, it's, 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 it is an insult. But I've had to come to the conclusion that, well, actually, if I look at that, that's exactly what I believe in. It's exactly what I believe in. I believe in small communities organizing themselves, devolution of power to the lowest possible point, taxation only to support the shared services center in the middle, um, and, and, a, and a policy of non-aggression in all aspects, uh, initiated non-aggression. So you come to the conclusion that the world as we know it at the moment is organized on exactly the opposite principles, and you have to dig your heels in. That's a very uncomfortable for somebody who, like me, who would prefer not to be political. And indeed, I probably am not. But I do have a fairly well-established and arguable set of personal principles around which I build my perspective. 
society and the way that we should be organized. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, it most certainly does. And I have a handful of questions spun out of that. The first of which would be, so I feel like based off of your writing that maybe we've crossed the Rubicon. And let me just grab one more quote from, from your work. As much as I regret it, we are moving into a time in which those who would rather be left alone must decide what is and is not important to them and stand up for it. Neutrality is no longer an option. Now, okay, so so why is that the case? And let me, in the context of which of these three libertarian principles are most under threat? Is it the sovereignty and you know, the ownership over oneself? Is it the anti-aggression uh, values or the right to own property or all of them? But what would, because there's-, there's It's also- the primary, it always, you have to go back to first principles. It's the primary one. We no longer own ourselves to okay. the full extent that we need to. I mean, a, a, a vaccine mandate hammered through the way that it was with zero, trust in the process that led to it and entirely mandated by aggressive diversive and divisionary policies incited deliberately to inflame in the face of of extraordinary evidence to the contrary just because it was policy that violated the most fundamental principle of of a stewardship care adherence to constitutional rights and violated that first principle of bodily autonomy so what is the risk today of neutrality maybe i am completely aligned with what you just shared i am offended by the policy but my process typically is to opt out of the discussion and move back to a don't bother me conservative liberal whatever but it's a don't bother me mentality i'd rather be left alone what's the danger of that right well now? yeah and i and so my my answer to that is to create your own area of autonomy and business is a building a business is a really good place to do that. Building a business is a place where probably the last place where because of its central importance to the economy, which politi- politicians and bureaucrats don't understand, they do not understand how business works. They really don't. Because none of them have to work and create value in order to take home a salary at the end of the month. Yeah. Um so they they tend to leave go for them last but by creating a business you can infuse it with your own principles and protect you yourself and your sanity by focusing on producing real something of real value in a community that is run on the principles that you believe to be sound and just so you can take people along with you in your business in that ecosystem of your business and live those principles and have at least a thin wall between you and the rest of the world or the world that is out to violate those principles. So it's not a question of taking a stand and, you know, marching on the streets and, or having, having heated discussions with people who you're not going to convince anyway. And that's not, that's not the point it's finding like-minded people and doing good work i think trusting that your time will come but it's often very very difficult you know the the pressure that people are under and you just take that you know the vaccine mandates people literally had to spend a year maybe a year and a half possibly without a job isolated yep. from the rest of society that was brutal in order to defend their beliefs and you know families were smashed mental health was 
was desecrated. Um, and yet enough people decided, no, that's enough. I'm not going to do it. That took enormous courage, took enormous courage and patience. And I think, you know, recognizing those incursions and doing something and still doing good work, still doing work that adds value, that's it's the best you can hope for. So I'm quite aligned with libertarian values. I am often asked why I'm not more combative and outspoken against, I guess, the power creep on those values. And, you know, we outlined what that is, gave one very classic and near term example, right, of a, a medical policy that was just forced upon a public offending the first principle of libertarian values, which is ownership over oneself. Therefore, since I feel that way, I should, I should take some sort of affirmative action with my platform, with my voice to call out bad actors and uh, essentially take a more aggressive stance. Now, that's not really in my personality type, so I don't do that so much. Um, but to your point about why argue with somebody whose mind you're never going to change? It's a futile endeavor, which is kind of my thought process. What you're saying is the better path, or maybe, you know, you said maybe, maybe the more productive path is just to lead by example, you know, and, and create your own autonomous world in the form of an organization, business or enterprise, or just your, your personal life and, and life path within your household. But we, so are you saying that's the more productive path and it might not be the most active, but, you know, leading by example is probably the best thing that anybody can do. Am I summarizing and understanding yes. your points? Yes, you are. Same thing? Yes, okay. you are. It's exactly. And, you know, your, your platform, your, your, your show was not set up to, um, as a soapbox for policy. People come to you for, for practical guidelines, wisdom from your various guests as to how to navigate difficult waters. And, you know, we're in the, probably the most difficult investment climate that we've had in 100 years. Um, it's brutal because nothing makes sense. We're in sort of Alice in Wonderland environment where you yeah. don't know what to believe. You know, we've, interest rates don't make sense. Equity prices make sense in the context of interest rates that don't make sense. Right. Um, there's two trillion of unspent private equity dry powder that's waiting to come in to buy what businesses off each other. It, nothing makes sense anymore. So this this time is extraordinarily difficult. And you've picked your fight, and that is to act as a voice of reason and give guidance to people who are looking for that wisdom to enable them to navigate. They're not coming to you for party political broadcasts. No. <laughs> why, why, why dilute your message doing that? It's not your job. There are others I, doing that. You can support others doing it, you know, yeah. who do have that voice if you want to. Um, but you're doing, you're doing what you think is right. Yes, I am. Yes. Okay. And, you know, and, and honestly, I, you know, arguing with people whose mind you're not going to change just, I think, hits the nail on the head. That's what Twitter's for. That's what, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is what Twitter's for. And uh, and so, you know, the, the path I take with this is like, what value could I add to the conversation? I, I think humility, right? Especially in the form of curiosity and recognizing that the human journey has just been a continued path of disproven absolute truths. And we don't really know what we feel we know, you know, it's, um, I look back on the rituals and beliefs of my ancestors 500,000 years ago and think it's almost comical and silly and fun to understand and, and, uh, and learn about. And I'm sure the same will be said about me in 500 or 1000 years, my core beliefs and absolute truths and, and the assumptions I make about reality. Uh, they're fluid and they're ever changing. So curiosity is such a great thing to bring to the table, as is compassion, because I don't know your path. I wasn't raised the way you were influenced by the people you were mentored by the individuals, had you been so lucky, or just put in the environment set and setting that crafted you and your thought process and how you interpret 
arguments and, and, you know, nature and, and human, you know, human behavior and all of this stuff. So of course we're never going to align fully and we're never going to interpret reality uh, the same because your formula is just different from my formula. If I was raised in, in your scenario, I would think the way you think, but I was raised in mine and I think the way I think. And so understanding that when we come up against opinions and personalities that we find so offensive and triggering, if you're able to, and it's not easy, but if you're able to default to compassion and say, look, I don't know where you're coming from. I could never understand where you're coming from. So therefore, like, let's just give a bit of space and a bit of patience here. Um, because I think the way you're interpreting things are just ridiculous and sensational. Uh, but I don't know where you're coming from. And I wasn't exposed to what you were exposed to. Maybe that's the reason you think the way you think. And I could have been in your shoes just as easily, but I wasn't. I'm in my shoes. And I probably seem just as extreme and hyperbolic to you as you seem to me um, and, and all of this. And then the last is like, I mean, you said it, it, it's sovereignty. It's just leading with that sense of autonomy, but it's taken accountability for your life and your actions and understanding that, you know, I put myself in this room, I could have put myself in any room. So I'm here by choice and I own it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And as soon as you don't, as soon as you, as soon as you um, excuse yourself from responsibility and accountability, you're given the power to somebody else. You're saying, well, it's their fault that my situation is what it is. And therefore putting that person in control and then taking your hands off the wheel and, and which is the worst thing you can do in terms of and determining what you want. Father, to as a father and husband, you know, that's, that's a pretty good audience to be authentic for. It, it, there's a wonderful line in or a little exchange in one of my favorite films, which was in, from the 1970s called A Man for All Seasons with Paul Schofield playing the role of Sir Thomas More in his sort of battle with Henry VIII over a matter of fundamental principle because Henry wanted to divorce his wife to marry somebody else because she couldn't bear him any children. And Thomas More took a very principled stand against it. And he was a powerful man, second most powerful man in the kingdom, next to the king. There was this great scene at the beginning where a young, ambitious lawyer comes to him and says, Sir Thomas, can you put in a good word for me so that I can have a good position in court? And Thomas says, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Be a teacher. And the young man is taken aback because he's ambitious and he wants to go to court and and he said, a teacher, who would know? And Thomas More looks at him and says, you, your pupils, God, not a bad public. And I think that that attitude of being good enough for your immediate family and circle, your, your community, church if you have one, your community, your neighbours if you don't, and your children, that's a pretty good audience. And you don't need you don't need more than that. If you're true to them, authentic to them, then that's you know four or five or maybe ten people you've influenced. And mm. That's it's good enough. Mm. I love that. I, I yeah, it's it's. I, I think I'm just going to wrap it up there. I <laughs> I, uh, I think that's such a powerful note to close on. You know, immediately I'm I'm curious, like what drives us though to impress a larger crowd and and strive for more recognition from people we don't even know, you know? And why is that a value that 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 I obsess over? I'm like I I I know in my I crave recognition. It's like it keeps me up at night. It puts a chip on my shoulder that it has value, you know, it, it drives me to perform every day, get out of bed early and fight. Um, but who am I trying to impress? Does it though? Does it though? Do you not do this because you want to produce a great show? I, I've not got one second of, of the impression that you are doing this for something other than to have a genuine conversation. You've been fully engaged. You asked great questions. You've tested me. You wouldn't do that if you weren't committed to your art or your craft. And it's the craft that keeps you going. It's I do the love craft it. That gets you up in the morning. Right. Yes. So, and that's it. It's good enough. Yes. And if if the recogn the recognition comes through other people recognizing your quality of craftsmanship, mm. that's where it comes from. And whether that's as an investor 
or as a carpenter or as a as a father you know, that's where it comes from and that has to be the motivation craftsmanship it strikes me as a as a of a quote uh from anne lamont who is a phenomenal yeah. writer yeah you, you, you probably yes. know her. yeah okay and uh she was describing how she teaches her pupils you know she's a, a, among many things she's a writing teacher and so frequently her students want to know how do i get an agent how do i get published right and they want to be a writer they don't sorry they want to publish books that's what her students her writing students want to do they want to publish books and she's very good at reframing that and saying you shouldn't care about publishing books you need to want to write and whether or not you ever publish a book, whether or not you ever get an agent, all that stuff is irrelevant because guaranteed what you're going to have to do every day is get up and write. And you need to love writing regardless of the outcome. And I I, I, I lean on that a lot, you know, because I, I love to write and I, I publish a weekly essay and it's my favorite thing that I do. And, and uh, but, uh, you know, I've, I've taken a lot from her in that specific context. If you don't love the process, then find a new process, maybe like find something there of which process you do love. Yeah. Which reminds me of a quote from Buffett from the 19, late 1980s, who said about him and Charlie, he said, we love the process more than the proceeds, but we have also learned to live with those. <laughs> love that. Well, yeah. I'll wrap it up there. That's an even better. Yeah, conclusion. that's a good one. <laughs> Look, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Sir Stephen Wilkinson, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm really glad we can make this happen, get you in front of my audience and just chat with me for over an hour. Um, an absolute honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now, if you want to take the next step, I publish a weekly newsletter and it's free. There's a link to subscribe right beneath this video. And you can join me and 50,000 other investors weekly for this exclusive content where I share my key action items and takeaways from conversations just like this and plenty others. Thanks for stopping by.